This is Business and Economy Network. My name is Peter Nwoche. I want to say thank you so very much for watching your program. You are watching Business and Economy Network. Have you taken out time to ponder over this? Our road networks in Nigeria, the agency saddled with that responsibility, FEMA, and how can road maintenance help our agriculturals, farmers, and other people transport their product and goods from one point to another? That's what we'll be looking at today on your program. I want to say thank you so very much for allowing us into your homes, offices, those of you watching us in far away, Abuja, Port Harcourt, Ilori, Kano, Kaduna, Sokoto, Asaba, Enugu, those of you watching us via the online channels and those of you outside the shores of Nigeria, I want to say thank you so very much for making that time to watch your number one business TV program. For the program rundown this week, we're looking at for Spotlight, we have the Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer of Federal Roads Maintenance Agency, FEMA. And not left out, for special report, we have the Chief Executive Officer of Okomo Oil Palm Company, PLC. And why for Straight Talk, we have the Country Coordinator for Cowpeel under the African Agricultural Technology Foundation. It's going to be an interesting watch. Relax yourself, brace up, because it's going to be deep, incisive, and very educative. I'll be back after this time out. Engineer Nuruddin Rafidadi, an engineer of repute with several decades of experience and outstanding work, and has served in various notable firms and capacity. Little wonder he was appointed as the managing director of the Federal Road Maintenance Agency, FEMA, in September 2017 by President Muhammad Buhari. FEMA as an agency is saddled with the responsibility to maintain most of Nigerian roads, especially federal roads. In every organization, training is vital, which is one reason why the agency has taken out time to cater for staff training, both formal and informal, like the provision of interactive forums, retreats, and ability for staff to share real-time day-to-day experiences on the job. In recent times, the MDCEO and the entire agency has been actively involved in social media as a short driver to push the activities of FEMA more to the Nigerian public. Indeed, we are, we are actually very serious with training. And since I have come, uh, I have tried to re-imbibe the culture of not only training, but having retreats with staff and forums that we can discuss and share our experiences, both physically and online. And since I have come, we have reinvigorated the uh, uh, media platform, social media platform of our staff, where we can discuss day-to-day real-time issues of maintenance of federal roads, and where professional suggestions are put forward to our staff that are right out there on site on the best way to handle different situations. Uh, why it is also necessary for us to keep imbibing training is that we need to keep developing new technologies one of the one of the early things that i i pushed when i resumed in fema about 15 months ago uh, is to create a platform for the management of our projects it is called project development management uh, services platform pdms and on that platform we deal with the handling of projects from the from the moment they are signed out to contractors and that platform deals with inputs from all our 38 state engineers and all our 12 zonal coordinators uh, and they put input regarding the progress reporting of the project regarding the field valuation of the value of what is actually done regarding certification for payment and regarding reporting generally and also regarding the monitoring and evaluation of the project these are new ways to deal and handle the projects that improve our efficiency but you have to train the staff in order to do that the staff of fema which is about a thousand five hundred plus now it's in fema you have the largest concentration of people that are experienced in maintaining and managing federal roads obviously because it's the only such agency in nigeria and um, all the staff need is a little motivation and training and reorientation and you will find that you get the best out of them well if I can sum it up the one thing for a young professional an engineer uh, is to say that you have to strive for excellence whatever you are doing 
try to excel. You see, we have a situation today where we have the largest population in, in our history of graduate, particularly of concern to me, graduate engineers who do not have a job. And the reason why they don't have a job is there's not enough jobs created from engineering works. Uh, that is one. Secondly, uh, there are engineering jobs that come to be done in this country but are being taken up by people from outside. Um, so, if you try to excel, you always arm yourself with the best skill. Uh, recently, fortunately for us, there has been a series of executive orders by the federal government that have mandated anyone engaged in engineering in Nigeria to first use Nigerian skills first. And there's a number of range of opportunities where this manifests. And we've discussed this at uh, the Association of Consulting Engineers. And I think it's a, it's a big challenge for us all as individual and collective professionals. As individual, you need to arm yourself and hone yourself with the skill because there is now a legal mandate for incoming companies. They are, it makes better business sense for them to look at the skill in Nigeria first. It is cheaper. Uh, collectively, we have a responsibility as professionals to, to be diligent, to look around and see infractions on that policy and report it. And if you report to Corin, Corin will take action. And so I see a lot of opportunities here. It doesn't remove the fact that the, the number of engineering graduates outpaces the number of available slots. But if you are excellent in your profession, I have seen cases of young professional engineers who have armed themselves and them, gotten skills that force us to look out, seek them, and actually employ them. I have come across uh, really outstanding young people who have, uh, who have done things in software, who have, who have produced good engineering works, even in FEMA, and my attention has been moved to them. And we have, we have sat down, we have thought how to maximize opportunities for our youth. Uh, one of the recent things we did in FEMA is to do what we call the stakeholder assisted right of way clearance uh, implementation. Basically, what it means is that clearing the roads along the right of way. The right of way of the federal highway is 18 meters from the center line on both sides. That, that, is, that, is, that, that land along that route belongs to nobody except the, the, because it falls on the right of way of the federal roads. And it is our duty to clear it. Sometimes you see overgrown bushes on the verges. Sometimes you, go, you need to go even beyond the verges. And we've gone to places where the communities themselves are saying, why don't you, not just for, uh, within the verges, why don't you go beyond and clear even more because of the menace of armed robbery and kidnapping. And we've done that in a few places where we found the, the community ready to come and assist even without paying, being paid. So because of that, we started this program where we, we register interested volunteer youth and uh, we, we, we document them and we deploy them. We buy kits and boots and tools for them and they clear the roads. And with that, the, our first trial is ongoing. It's about to finish now. It's to take about 14, 15,000 youths from across the country and pay them the minimum wage. It used to be 18. Now it will move to 30. And uh, for two months, we've engaged them. We first document them. Those without bank accounts, we get them to open the bank accounts because we have, we have to remit your money through your accounts. Uh, that's that's uh, mandatory. And then we, we deploy them to the work. And I found out even graduate engineers and non-engineers alike were ready and willing to participate in this program. The Okomo Oil Palm Company PLC is situated in Edo State, Nigeria, on not less than the 34,000 hectare of palm and rubber. The managing director, Dr. Graham Herfa, expressed player on the cordial relationship with host communities. Directly or indirectly, community people have been involved in contracts and laws has been taken as employees of Okomo Oil Palm Company. Just as Okomo expands inside, its corporate environment is also expanding. The firm has continued to provide basic amenities for the community 
like water, hospitals, market stores, and bursary for students. Okomu stands out considering its rich staff upgrade, constant training, health and safety methods, and proper retirement trainings for intending retirees. Well, yeah, look, I mean, uh, to us, you know, we are not an island, and uh, our communities surrounding, su surrounding all our plantations are very, very important to us. Not only do they work as, uh, as partners for us, because a lot of them are contractors, a lot of them are employees, a lot of them are, are doing uh, indirect work which assists us and helps our company to, to survive. So, you know, we, we, there's a lot of give and take. Uh, in, in that regard, we also espouse to the rules and regulations pertaining to the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, RSPO. Uh, we are in the process of being certified. We are hoping that our certification will come through by the end of this year, uh, which will mean that uh, we, we are making sure that our palm oil is a sustainable palm oil and that we are not uh, destroying vegetation, the, the environment, and are making sure that our socio-economic programs are up to standard. So part and parcel of that is obviously working together with the upgrading and development of the communities that surround us. We do that. Uh, in the last seven years, we have been providing uh, our communities with uh, things such as uh, uh, toilets, with uh, things such as market stores, uh, school blocks, hospital blocks, uh, boreholes, anything that will, 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 will assist them in developing their, their community. Uh, and we do also other, uh, have things like bursaries. We, we, we give bursaries for, for tertiary institutions. And uh, yeah, these, these, are, these are all the areas that we look at to help to ensure that they develop as a community along with our development. Uh, we do not want to see them left behind because if we develop, they should develop. And that's how our partnership works with, with, with our communities. And I must say, uh, our communities are very, very uh, uh, good communities. Uh, we appreciate them uh, and uh, we have a very good rapport. And uh, if there's something that uh, they don't like, there are grievance mechanisms, we use them. We have a lot of communication and uh, hopefully it, it continues to get better. Yeah, look, I mean, we have around 5,000 direct employees. If you work on, on indirectly, you, you could probably use the uh, multiply effect of about five to six. So there's a, there's a lot of, uh, of, of uh, people who benefit both directly and indirectly with the company. <clears throat> and that's why it's so important. Uh, you know, if you take a, a contractor, he employs people as well. So it, it's huge, you know, the, if, you, if you look at it like that. So, but it's also important for us that we, we keep up to, to date with modern technology and what is happening in retraining and reskilling our, our employees is critical. Uh, and we do this on an annual basis. Uh, last year, if my memory serves me correct, I think we spent around 25 million Naira uh, on retraining. Um, we also work together with, uh, with consulting firms to make sure that areas of concern are, are where we are upgrading our staff. Our managers uh, are, are tasked to make sure that our people are up to date both with uh, HSE matters, health, safety and environment is critical for us. Um, we have machinery here that is, is, is dangerous. We need to make sure that our people are trained and, 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 and look after uh, how they work there. We have also, for those that are, are going to be retiring from our company, we give them training for pre-retirement and, and retirement so, how, so they don't run out of money. They, they hopefully learn how to manage their, their, their finances when they're in retirement. We have, uh, uh, we have in-house uh, workshops on, uh, on computer training because obviously it's important that our people are kept up to speed. So yeah, we, we do a myriad of things uh, every year. And Sure, I mean, I don't know if everybody knows the Kumo National Park, but it's probably, it is the smallest uh, national park in the country but it has biodiversity that is only found in this park and nowhere else in the world. Uh, more specifically, the white-throated monkey. It also has forest elephant and forest buffalo. So it, uh, it is very unique in, 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 in that it holds only these species within the park and nowhere else. Uh, as part of our ongoing uh, uh, RSPO development plan, we, because we are neighbors to the national park, 
we we are very very happy to work together with them because uh, the palm plantation yet that you see here is actually an extension of the park the animals move backwards and forwards between it so you will see buffalo sometimes come through our through our place uh, we've had some elephant um, and and obviously the smaller animals so we have areas uh, that are buffer zones which we uh, do not plant uh, in because they are fragile uh, uh, ecosystem there or they uh, they hold a river source for instance so we make sure that we do not plant there in fact of our 34,000 hectares more than 10 percent of our total area is under high conservation value or buffer zones now these we try and integrate together with uh, the the national park so that the the animals have unfettered usage and they can move backwards and forwards quite easily uh, we are also working uh, and are funding uh, the Okumu national park management plan this is where we are trying to put a, 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 a holistic plan together which is sustainable in the long run which assists and works together with us and with the communities to make sure that at the end of the day the park becomes sustainably run. With the arrival of, of the governor uh, a couple of years ago, in, uh, it has been a breath of fresh air. We, we, we have worked very, very well with the governor. Um, the, the, his philosophy and the way he works is, is very, very heartening to see. And uh, I know he's been putting a lot of work and effort into uh, making sure that agriculture in Edo State uh, is a viable option. Uh, in fact, for us, Edo State is an agricultural state. Uh, and what he is doing, I think, is a very, very good thing. Um, I mean, obviously, it's going to take time. There's a lot of things that need to be fixed, put in place, and, 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 and work together with. And we are very happy to, to partner him with him in this uh, uh, area to go forward to take Edo State into the 21st century. Um, it's important not only for the government but also for us. I mean we, we want to see development because uh, if you look at it selfishly we want a bigger tax base, uh, a, a broader tax base, excuse me, uh, so that everybody can, can benefit. Without that it tends to put a lot of pressure on those companies including ourselves for paying taxes and doing all the all the things that we should be doing and are doing but if we can get more people in why not and and this we we, we are very very happy with this philosophy and we are we are sitting with the governor and trying to work out how we get to grips with improving uh, education f uh, so that we have better better employees uh, improving the, uh, the the environment and and everything that surrounds it and I'm very, very happy with, with the way things are going. Africa Agricultural Technology Foundation, AATF, was set up to bridge the gap and proffer solutions to the challenges of agriculture in Africa. AATF is to address the issues of food security in Africa with focus in Nigeria with the aid of recent agricultural technologies. In a chat with the Business and Economy Network crew, the regional head and Kalpi project head, Dr. Kolo Abdurrahmani, who enlightened us on matters of GMOs, he said, genetically modified organism food is helping to increase food sufficiency, food security, and rescue to rural people from pains and hunger. GMO foods are actually the same conventional crops that are improved on to tackle persistent issues like shortage of food and insect infestation on crops. Notable success has been recorded despite of the criticism that has trailed the introduction of GMO foods into Nigerian food and farming system. Are very safe. We are even safe when we become. We are even safer when the varieties breed by conventional means. No food crop are being analyzed for safety as much as GMOs. So if you take in the US, you got up to three institutions who are involved. Food and Drug Administration, the APA and others have the third one. There is a third one involved. They have to be convinced absolutely by the scientific data, by the data, the experiments done on safety. This free institution has to be convinced but what is being proposed is highly safe. 
And if there is a single doubt, they stop the process of developing it. So GMOs are the safest food on the market. The GMOs today, the GM varieties are the safest food on the market. What is happening? We got two things happening. One is in the mid 80s and older, there are some crazy people who think that, oh no, we need to go back to primitive agriculture. They start calling this primitive agriculture bio organic farming. So in the 80s, there are some, I call them crazy people who say we need to abandon all this development, all this big agriculture and go back to primitive agriculture. You don't use fertilizers, you don't use pesticide, you don't use anything. You just use it, you just do agriculture the way Adam and Eve used to do it. So, that's where all these things started. We cannot go back to primitive agriculture. And they label their primitive agriculture, they gave it a good name, organic farming, bio farming, and they look a good brand name to mislead people. So now they create organic farming companies, big companies. There are big organic farming companies. But 80% of the farms, we call themselves organic farming. There is a recent study which show that 80% are not organic. Because organic farming, is the yield are in entry low. So the rich, the upper rich can afford it to buy it if they want. But the common people, the middle class and lower income people cannot. This is for upper, upper 1.001% rich people. They don't want, they want their food produced in the primitive conditions like we, it used to be 300 years ago. Let them go. But what cannot feed a country? This is where, this is why we in Africa, we are in trouble because we are not able to bring modern science and technology. 60 million farmers, that's a lot of numbers, but I think we can, it can be reached uh, by in three years' time, because it's not the small office here who will do all the work. No, we'll be working with universities, we'll be working with extension departments at universities, and we'll be working with federal extension people a lot, wherever they are. The idea is to work with the extension people. So, and uh, when the extension people do their work, we'll, we'll give them, we'll work with them, we'll teach them, and uh, we'll train them, and we'll give them some help so that they can do their work better. We will try to put them in better condition to achieve their work. So each state, each local government have extension office. So you work, if you work with this extension office, you can reach a lot of farmers in three years. Uh, in three years, I think the number can be achieved. But the idea is to work with the extension. If you don't work with the extension, you fail. And I am glad here, it is the extension office which is hosting us. So we got good friends, they know it. <laughs> I will rely on them. I will rely heavily, and uh, the project will rely heavily on them to, to get the work done. So it doesn't matter. If you, and also, in agriculture, you know, a good product sells itself. If a farmer saw on, on one farmer's field how this cowpea is, per, the performance, it will go from mouth to, to ear, mouth to ear. Hey, where is a new thing here in town? So everybody, so we, that's the way variety is sometimes. When you get a good variety, you start demonstrating to farmers, it will go 200 kilometers. People in 200 kilometers will get the news. But there is a new variety in town which is performing better and they will start asking for it. So the order we come to, uh, this also will be very helpful. And also, we'll get uh, brochures, leaflets, and also TV, your TV channel program will be solicited, will be on TV showing when we do our demonstration trials, the TV, all the TVs and the radio will be invited 
So I think on the broadcast it, millions of farmers will, <laughs> will get venues. So we need, we need not only the extension agent, but we need also you and your, your TV programs. This is Business and Economy Network. Welcome back viewers. We where we draw the wrap of the program this week. Remember, this week is the Holy Week for Christian and Christian brothers and sisters. I want to say to you, take out this period to reflect over the very important and essence of Easter, which in Christendom they say is the greatest Christian celebration or festival. On behalf of the production crew, we want to wish all our Christian faithful successful Easter celebration. Please be very wise, be very careful, and also watch and pray for our leaders. Happy Easter in advance to each and every one of you. God bless Nigeria and God bless you.